morning, everybody. Hello to everyone joining us online as well. Let's pray together. Father, we're here. We've come to worship you, to sing your praise. God, to lift up your holy name. So, Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to come fill this place, Lord. God, we know that your word says that you inhabit the praises of your people. Lord, we've come to praise you. And we know that you're here right now. Lord, we invite you, Holy Spirit, to fill this place in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen.
only our fourth study in first Peter and it's been a few weeks and so let's just go back let me remind you that our series title is standing firm in a hostile world and Peter was writing to a group of believers that were living in what was the Roman provinces of Asia Minor we just call it modern-day Turkey and so these believers that were living there were experiencing what you and I would call mild persecution. They were being marginalized and some of them were losing jobs, but you know, they weren't losing their lives for their faith yet. But Peter was living in Rome and in Rome, the persecution against Christians was really heating up. Peter knew that it wouldn't be long until the believers that he was writing to here in modern day Turkey began to experience a real increase and that their minor persecution would soon be turning towards major life-threatening persecution. And so what does Peter do? Look up at the screen. I, I, I want you to get this, maybe take a picture of this, email me, I'll send you a picture of my notes. This is in there. But this is what I really want you to know for our whole journey through First Peter, is that Peter wrote this epistle to equip believers to stand firm in Christ and to live exemplary lives in the midst of a culture that was becoming more and more atheistic and increasingly hostile to Christians and to their biblical beliefs. Now, I cannot think of a better New Testament epistle for us to be studying at this time in history as American Christians than First Peter because of this, because you and I need to be encouraged and exhorted how to live as the nation that we live in becomes more and more hostile to our faith. And believe me, the heat is going to continue to turn up as time goes on. And so today's message is titled, Living in Awe of Our Salvation. We're going to study 1 Peter 1, verses 10 through 12. And I'd like you to stand with me again. We're going to stand and we are going to read the text that we're going to study and we're going to pray, and then we are going to dig deep into these 
three verses ahead of us. So let's put the scriptures up on the screen so that we can all read this together. And would you, would you join me? Let's read out loud. And uh, this is from the New King James, so if you have a different version, you may want to look up here on the screen. But this is what Peter writes. He says, Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Father, as we open our hearts, we open our Bibles, maybe some people are opening Bible apps on their electronic devices, Lord, we are opening ourselves to the leading and the teaching of the Holy Spirit because we believe that in these three verses today, Lord, you are going to remind us what it means to live in awe of our salvation. And so we really praise you, God. You're so good. And we're expecting that you're going to speak to all of us. Lord, first, you're going to bless and encourage us. You're probably going to confront us. You're going to exhort us. You're going to give us marching orders. As we walk out of this building today, Lord, we will have been equipped to stand in this hostile world and to stand as the world becomes more hostile to our faith, Lord. So to that end, Lord, please be our teacher. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. I'm going to share a story with you. Can I do that? Just going to start with a story from my childhood. A very embarrassing story. When I was about nine or ten years old, um, my parents asked me what I wanted for Christmas. And I don't think a second went by before these words blurted out of my mouth. I told them that I wanted a Firefox radio-controlled off-road racer. Guys, do you remember these, any of you guys my age and above? They, it was the ultimate radio control car of my generation, okay? I had wanted one since the first time I saw one advertised on the Saturday morning cartoons. It's back when cartoons were only on Saturday morning. And then... What happened is I was hooked because our local toy store at the mall had demos that crazy kids like me could go in and test drive so that you would get hooked and go home and tell your parents you wanted one for Christmas. And so I told my parents what I wanted. My dad checked it out and he came back and he said, it's too expensive. You're going to have to find something more affordable. So I don't know what I told him I wanted, but probably with a sad face. Well, Christmas Day comes and dad had tricked me and he had purchased, he and my mom, one of these Firefox radio-controlled racers. And I, guy, I want to tell you, church, I, I thought that I was going to come out of my skin. My best friend Chris got one also, so I think our parents had kind of conspired. And for a couple of hours, I was absolutely consumed with this thing that I was, I was just convinced this thing was going to change my life forever, right? And, and then about halfway through Christmas Day, I began to realize that this thing was not nearly as cool as what the TV commercials had advertised. And then the batteries would die in no time at all, and that was before the time of affordable rechargeables. And by the end of Christmas Day, I literally boxed it up, went back to my parents and said, can we return this to the store and get something better, right? Now, the reason I share this story with you is because the text that we're in today really describes that that exact same thing happens among many Christians when it comes to their salvation. What happens is that they're initially in complete awe of their salvation. They are in complete awe of Jesus and the free gift that he has given them. But then when suffering and trials and hardship begin to set in, their, their focus shifts from this amazing, awe-inspiring salvation to these overwhelming trials, tribulations, testings, persecutions, and all of that. And in these three verses that we're going to study today, Peter's going to challenge you and I. I'm going to call us suffering saints. He's going to challenge suffering saints to live in awe of their salvation by remembering three things about your salvation. He's going to tell us here that the prophets predicted our salvation. He's going to remind us that preachers proclaimed our salvation. And then this really weird short sentence, he's going to tell us that angels ponder 
our salvation. And so we've got a lot of ground to cover today, but I want to share with you what my goal is. As a fellow believer, but as a leader in the body of Christ, I see that we're living in a time where a lot of Christians are no longer in awe of their salvation. They're in awe of everything that's challenging their day-to-day life. My goal today is to help everybody present and everybody watching online regain the wonder and the awe of their salvation. The salvation is the greatest gift that God has ever given to mankind, the forgiveness of sins, the restoration of a broken relationship with our perfect creator. These are the things that Jesus has given to us that we call our salvation. And today I want to just challenge you to return to the awe of your salvation. So let's look at how Peter did that to his audience. He speaks to us first about the theme of these first 12 verses, and I'll talk about this more next week, but would you look back at the beginning of the chapter? Go back to verse 3 of chapter 1. We're going to talk about Peter's theme. Read this verse with me. Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So Peter opens this letter by reminding believers that they should rejoice. He says, listen, believers, if anybody in this world has reason to rejoice, he he says, it's you. He, He says, you were once dead in your sin and in your trespasses, but God in his abundant mercy and his grace has made you alive again through faith in the finished work of his son, Jesus, right? He he says you've received a second birth. You were born physically alive, but spiritually dead. But at the moment of salvation, your spirit came to life. Your spirit was animated by the Holy Spirit. Jesus called this in John chapter three, being born again. And in these first 12 verses, Peter describes it with the word salvation three different times. Verses 5, verses 9, and verse 10. He uses the word salvation. Now, if you were to get out your concordance and you were to start doing some scholarly study, you'd find that the various forms of the word salvation, such as salvation, saved, etc., these words are used over 400 times in the Bible. In Exodus chapter 14, Moses uses this word to describe how God saved Israel from the Egyptian army. Psalm chapter 38, David uses this word to describe how God saved him from some adversaries that wanted to take his life. And as we've studied through the New Testament, we've seen that the apostles used the same word to describe sinners being saved from the eternal penalty of our sin. What Peter wants us to know in these first 12 verses is that his main theme is our salvation. The fact that God has saved us from the eternal penalty of our sin. He's made us born again. And I'm going to ask you a couple of questions to, to try to get us all on the same page here as we get into the first Peter text. Can you do a, a, a favor and, and just maybe... In your mind, go back to that moment that you were saved. Some people don't remember the exact date. I don't remember the exact date that I was saved. But I sure remember the moment. And I remember that in that moment that I got saved, I heard the gospel, I I confessed my sin, I turned from it, and God forgave me. I realized that I had been forgiven, and a couple of things happened. And I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to return to that moment that this happened to you. It was that moment where you realized that God's love for you had been shown through his perfect son leaving heaven, coming to earth, living a perfect life on your behalf, dying a substitutionary death, going into a grave, and then on the third day being raised from the dead to proclaim that you didn't have to fear death and you didn't have to fear the penalty of death or hell or any of those other things. I want you to remember that moment and the joy that you experienced. And then I want you to remember what it felt like when the shame and the guilt of your sin were taken off of your shoulders and all of a sudden you realized, I'm free. And then I want you to remember the excitement. I don't know what it was like for you, but I was a young teenager and I knew about three Bible verses 
And my friend and I used to ride our bicycles a couple of miles to an Albertson's grocery store parking lot and every evening share the gospel with people. All we knew is we were saved and we were going to heaven and we were leading people to Christ with three Bible verses. It was amazing. We were so excited about Christ and I hope you were too. But now what I want you to do is I want you to compare those early days of your salvation to today. And I want to ask you, are are you as excited about your salvation? Are you as in awe of your salvation as you were on the day that you were saved? Because I'm finding that many Christians are not. We're more in awe of how bad the political system is in our nation. Or we're more in awe of every other bad thing going on. And when you talk to Christians, how's it going? I don't know, man. I don't think I can go on another day. Well, what's going on? And then all of a sudden we're talking about politics and we're talking about coronavirus and we're talking about, oh, monkeypox is coming. And we're talking about all these other things. And very rarely do you walk up to a Christian and just say, how's it going? And they go, man, my mind is blown. 30 years ago, Jesus died on the cross for me. And every moment of my existence, I'm just like, wow. I don't remember the last time someone responded to me that way when I asked how it's going. And Peter is coming along and he's saying, listen, I am going to help you regain that awe that you used to have by looking at three things. And he says, we're going to talk about how the prophets predicted your salvation. Look at verses 10 and 11. Peter wants his readers to understand that our salvation is not some novel new thing that just God all of a sudden one day said, hey, I think I might start saving some people. He wants us to understand that long before Jesus paid the price for our sins on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago, that the prophets were already proclaiming this salvation that you and I enjoy today. Look at 1 Peter 1, verses 10 and 11. Peter says, of this salvation, so again, we're talking about salvation. He says, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. So Peter says here, he says, I want you to see how obvious it is that the Old Testament prophets were interested in our salvation. Now I want to talk about these Old Testament prophets. In the Old Testament, prophets played a couple of primary roles, and they both had to do with God's Word. They they proclaimed God's Word, and we're seeing this every Wednesday night as we're going through the Old Testament. Right now, we're in Jeremiah, and every single week, we see God speak to Jeremiah with His Word, and then Jeremiah turns around, and he proclaims God's Word to the people of Judah. So the prophets proclaimed God's Word, but on Wednesday nights, we're also seeing the second role of prophets, and that's that they predict future events. And we saw Jeremiah predict a lot of stuff, but the greatest was what we call the Babylonian captivity. And chapter after chapter, he said, the Babylonians are coming. The Babylonians are coming. The false prophet said, no, the Babylonians aren't coming. In 605 BC, guess what happened? The Babylonians arrived. And so that's the pattern that we see throughout the Old Testament with the prophets. Now, Peter's drawing our attention here in verses 10 and 11 to a specific area of prophecy that we call messianic prophecy, the prophecies that are directly related to the promised Messiah. And I'll show you a few things that Peter points out. Look at verse 10 with me. He says, of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully. What he's saying to us, and let's just take Isaiah, okay, for, for as an example. He says, you know, once Isaiah realized that he wasn't speaking about somebody in his time, but this future Messiah that would come, Isaiah started searching the writings of other men who were writing messianic prophecies, like Micah and Zechariah and Jeremiah and, and Moses and David. And he's saying that, that Isaiah realized, I'm, I, I'm writing about this coming Messiah, but I want to learn as much as I can about him by writing, reading, excuse me, the prophecies written by the other messianic authors. He says, I want to I understand the whole picture of Messiah, Isaiah would say, or Micah would say, or Jeremiah would say, or any of these others. Now, now this is what's interesting. We realize through our studies 
that there are over a thousand prophecies in the Bible altogether. Over 500 that scholars tell us have clearly been fulfilled. Now, there's about 330 prophecies about Jesus the Messiah. Those are specifically about his first coming. 330 prophecies about Jesus' first coming. Can I just share 16 of those with you? I'm not going to even put it on the screen. I'm just going to read this list that I put together. Isaiah wrote that Messiah would be born of a virgin, chapter 7, verse 14. Micah added that he'd be born in Bethlehem, chapter 5, verse 2. Moses wrote that he'd be born into the tribe of Judah, Genesis 49, 10. Isaiah said that Messiah's ministry would begin in Galilee, chapter 9, verse 1 and that he'd work miracles, chapter 35, verses 5 and 6. Zechariah said that he'd enter into Jerusalem on a donkey, chapter 9, verse 9. David said that he'd be betrayed by a close friend, Psalm 41, 9. Zechariah added to that prophecy that that close friend would receive 30 pieces of silver, uh, Zechariah 11:12. 12. David said that his garments would be torn and that men would cast lots for them, Psalm 22:18. Isaiah said that Messiah would be beaten and bruised, chapter 53, verse 5. David added that his hands and feet would be pierced, Psalm 22, 16. And then Isaiah said that he'd be crucified between two thieves, chapter 53, verse 12, but that none of his bones would be broken, Psalm 34, verse 20. And then Zechari Zechariah added that his side would be pierced, chapter 12, verse 10. Isaiah said that he'd be buried in a rich man's tomb, chapter 53, verse 9. And David said that he would eventually rise from the dead, Psalm chapter 16, verse 10. That is just 16 of over 300, possibly 330, prophecies written about the Messiah that you and I can look back on and see that they were all fulfilled by Jesus exactly as they were prophesied. For what reason? your salvation, and my salvation. Now, let me share this. I've shared this a number of times, so I'm going to move quickly through this. But there's a man named Dr. Peter Stoner. You can look him up. He wrote a book called Science Speaks. And he talked about probability and statistics regarding the prophecies of Jesus. And he wanted to come up with some illustrations of how outlandish it is for one person to be able to fulfill 300 plus prophecies. So he says, let's start with eight prophecies. And let's try to figure out the probability of one human being being able to fulfill just eight of the messianic prophecies. So he did his math and he said that the odds of one person fulfilling just eight predictive prophecies about the Messiah is 1 in 10 to the 17th power. So that would be 10 with 17 zeros behind it. Now, we all like illustrations, right? So Stoner says, Let, let's uh, illustrate this. He said, if you were to take the entire state of Texas and cover it two feet deep with silver dollars, and one of those silver dollars you had put a mark on, you throw that in the mix. Then you blindfold a man and send him to Texas. The odds of him finding and grabbing that one silver dollar on the first try is about 10 to the 17th power. That's about the odds of that. Okay, I, I don't know about you, but I don't want to try something like that, do you? That, that's quite a task. And he says, but that's only eight. He says, let's talk about 16. He says, in order for one person to fulfill 16 messianic prophecies, the statistics, the odds go up to 10, 1 in 10 to the 45th power. 10 with 45 zeros behind it. Can we illustrate it? We're still going to use silver dollars. But what Stoner says is that you would have to create this sphere, a, a big globe. And from the center of that globe to the outer circumference would be 30 times the distance from the earth to the sun, which is 93 million miles. So 30 times 93 million. That's how big this sphere is. And you would fill it with silver dollars 
Mark 1, send a blindfolded man into that sphere and the odds of him finding that one silver dollar on his first try is 10 to the 45th power. Are you starting to get what Peter's telling us? Peter is saying all of these Old Testament prophets were moved by the Lord to show you how important your salvation is that God would go to these lengths to show it to you. Shall we illustrate 300? Stoner says he, he actually does it, but now what he does is he starts taking these globes, these enormous globes, and instead of using silver dollars, he uses electrons. That's the odds of one person fulfilling just 300. And so let's look here at what Peter tells us that the Old Testament prophets knew. And then we'll look at what they didn't know. And then we'll move on. Look at verse 10 still. Peter said here about them, he said that they prophesied of the grace that would come to you. And then jump into verse 11. Peter says, the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. So the Old Testament prophets, they knew a couple of things. They knew that Messiah would endure some act of suffering that would allow God's grace to be extended to sinners. Can anybody say thank you, Lord? Right? They were predicting what you and I know as the cross of Calvary where Jesus bore the sin of all mankind. But they didn't understand what they were predicting. None of them would have said, hey, he's going to die on a Roman cross. They just knew he was going to fulfill this act of suffering that would allow God's grace to be extended to you and I. Jump ahead to verse 12. In the beginning of the verse, it says, to them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us they were ministering. And so the Old Testament prophets also had this sense that they were writing and ministering to people beyond their time they began to realize Messiah is not coming during our lives, but Messiah is coming many years later. And then notice in verse 11, Peter also says, searching what the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating. And so they they knew that these prophecies weren't coming from themselves. They knew that these prophecies were coming from the Holy Spirit and before I make this point, I want to have you look at the screen for a minute because in 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter reminds us of something that's so important for us to remember when we study prophecy or when we're talking to people about biblical prophecy. Look what Peter wrote. He said, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so Peter says, listen, the Holy Spirit used prophecy to speak of things coming, and then the Holy Spirit gives the interpretation of those prophecies. So I don't know if you ever see, uh, I hope I don't offend anybody, but you know those wacky guys on TV? And no matter what's going on in the world, they're going to find a scripture and say it's a prophecy. You know, I remember when the Twin Towers fell, there were all these guys on TV and they were going to these obscure, weird verses in the Old Testament saying that this had been prophesied. And I just remember I I was teaching at our Calvary Chapel private Christian school at that time. And in my Bible classes, I was telling our students, be careful what you're listening to right now because the scriptures say that interpreting prophecy is of the Holy Spirit. It's not just, you know, Bible roulette. So if an airplane crashes and some prophet gets on and says, listen, Zechariah prophesied about this. Be careful listening to those guys. Peter says, there's a lot of dangerous men out there who call themselves Bible teachers. And so Peter wants us to know that, you know, these guys were searching the scriptures, looking for Messiah, but there were things they didn't know. Look at verse 11. Peter's going to tell us what the Old Old Testament prophets didn't know. Notice In verse 11, and I'm going to put this up on the screen in the ESV. We've already read it in the New King James, but this is a better translation. Inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. And so what Peter's saying here is that the Old Testament authors, the Old Testament prophets, they didn't know who the Christ would be. And they didn't know, even despite Daniel's prophecies, when he was going to come. Or maybe I should say that they didn't know when he was going to come until Daniel wrote his prophecies of chapter 9. 
But they were looking for who's the Christ going to be, and they said, we haven't been able to figure it out. When's the Christ going to come? We haven't been able to figure it out. I love this uh, comment I found. I forgot to put who the author is. I can get it for you if you need it. But look at the screen. This is what this guy wrote. He said, it's like God gave the Old Testament prophets the task of working together to assemble a 1,000-piece jigsaw puzzle of Messiah. Each prophet had some of the pieces, but none of them had a picture of what the puzzle was supposed to look like. Have you ever done a puzzle and you don't have the box, so you don't even know what you're trying to do? And this is, that's a perfect illustration. You've got these prophets that lived in different places during different time periods. They're all writing a little part of the messianic story, yet none of them really knew who they were writing about. And then, what's so cool, is you and I are given the New Testament. And as we read the New Testament, we're able to put all of these little puzzle pieces together and realize every one of those Old Testament prophets, every one of those 330 predictions of Messiah points to Jesus. Can I give you another illustration? This one really hit it for me, okay? This same guy in his commentary on Daniel said, I want you to picture all of the Old Testament prophets that were writing about Messiah as archers. And every one of their prophecies was like an arrow that they stepped back and shot into the sky. And it went out over the horizon and they never saw where that arrow landed. But as we read the New Testament and we see the fulfillment of all those prophecies, we realize that all those archers shot their arrows in one direction and they all landed on Jesus. Isn't that an awesome illustration? I hope it works for you. For me, that was just like, yeah, that's exactly how it was. All of these guys writing about one man. So you and I, we have the New Testament, and by it, we are able to assemble that 1,000-piece puzzle about Messiah. Study that on your own. You'll just be blown away when it comes to Messianic prophecy. So that leads us to Peter's second point. He's trying to keep us in awe of our salvation. The first thing he said is, Thousands and thousands of hours were invested writing prophecy so that hundreds of prophecies could be written and you could read them knowing that God wrote them as a love letter to you. The second thing he says is that preachers proclaimed it. Once the things predicted by these Old Testament prophets were fulfilled, a new group of messengers were brought onto the scene by the Holy Spirit. They were entrusted to carry the message of the gospel to their world. Now, before we keep reading in 1 Peter, look at the screen, because I want to set the stage for this next section by looking at Luke chapter 24, verses 46 through 48. It's Luke's version of what we call the Great Commission, right? Jesus is about to ascend to his Father and he says to them, verse 20, or chapter 24, verse 46, he says, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And so his birth, his life, his ministry, his death, his burial, and his resurrection fulfilled all of those 300 prophecies, and his disciples began to recognize that. They were convinced by those things that he was Messiah. They put their faith in him, and they were saved. They were the first generation of believers. And Jesus says to them, he says, I have a command. My command is for you to go out now and make disciples. And he gives us some steps here. He says, step one, you need to wait in Jerusalem until you're empowered by the Holy Spirit. We read about the fulfillment of that in Acts chapter 2. And then step two was for them to take the message of salvation in his name to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. They were supposed to go out and tell people, listen, the Savior is here. You need to repent and receive forgiveness in his name. And then the next step was for them to make disciples, to take that message and go. And so what did they do? They stayed in Jerusalem for a long time until God raised up a guy named Saul of Tarsus to persecute the church and get them fleeing. 
And the book of Acts tells us that as they fled, they told everybody they came in contact with about Jesus the Messiah. And so the first generation of preachers were the apostles. But then they handed that baton to all of the believers, and the believers took the gospel everywhere they went. Look at 1 Peter 1.12. I'm going to read the whole thing, but we're going to only focus on part of it. To them, it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. So Peter says, he says, hey, listen, I was part of that process. I was there when Jesus gave those words in Luke 24. I received the Great Commission. I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Peter says very humbly, I was the first one to publicly preach a gospel message and 3,000 men got saved that day. No, I don't think Peter did that. Peter, Peter was the first one to preach and see thousands and thousands saved, but I think he was humble. And then later in Acts chapter 4, he would preach again and he would say, there is only one name under heaven by which we must be saved, the name Jesus, right? Peter says, but then others heard the message and they went out and it was them that carried the gospel to you. That's what Peter just said. He says, you're saved because the Holy Spirit empowered faithful men and faithful women to take the gospel message that they had heard, leave Jerusalem and go to the uttermost parts of the earth, preaching salvation in the name of Jesus and him alone. And it's interesting because that brings us to a quick application. Centuries later, that exact pattern continued. Started with the apostles. It went on. It went generation after generation. And then somebody preached the gospel to you. And you heard the gospel message, and you made a decision to confess your sin and place your faith in the finished work of Jesus, and, and now you're saved. And Peter goes, man, you should be in awe of your salvation. It started with the Old Testament prophets. It went on to the apostles, and then just normal people like us who have kept that message going generation after generation after generation. Can I give you a name? Grace Rubel. Mean anything to you? means nothing to you. It means the world to me because she was the neighbor that took me to First Baptist Albuquerque where Pastor Rick Tillman opened his Bible, taught from John chapter 3, and Randy Lucero received Christ as Savior. Okay? Who is your Grace Rubel and Rick Tillman? And more importantly, and I do not say this to bring condemnation on anybody, please, 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 this is supposed to be encouraging, but who is supposed to be this week saying, thank God for you and 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 you because they were at the gas pump next to me and they saw my somber face and said, hey, you okay? And I just said, no, I just, I just got news. Oh, can I pray with you? We're, we're at a gas pump, not a church. Yeah, we could pray at a gas pump. Can I pray with you? Yeah, and then you pray with them and they're like, you're weird. And then you say, you're right, I am. Can I tell you about my friend Jesus? And, and the next thing you know, they're praying again, this time to receive Christ. Peter says, you should be so in awe of your salvation that when you meet somebody who needs salvation, that you should be the one that 15 years later, they stand up and they say your name because you're the one that brought Christ to them. Over the years, I want to tell you, I've been so blessed. I love technology. I am so blessed when I get a phone call, an email, or, or even better, someone walks through the doors, and this happens regularly because of our YouTube ministry and, and the fact that our website puts all of our teachings out. I have told you, excuse me, I have been told more times than I can count by someone who has walked through the door and said, Pastor Andy, I'm so glad to finally meet you. I've been listening for years. You led me to Christ. And they'll tell me the Bible story that that, or the study that I was giving that day. I've never even met them, but through technology, I've had the privilege to share the gospel, and they heard it, and it's, it's, it's my name that when they think of their salvation, they're like, hey, it was a bunch of people, but, but Pastor Andy, it was when you led a sinner's prayer, and I was listening on YouTube, and that was the day of my salvation. I want to tell you, that is humbling, but it's exciting. It's exciting, and I want to throw out a challenge. I really believe that we're living in the last part of the last days and that we're going to hear Jesus come back 
soon. We're going to hear that trumpet and the rapture is going to take place. And there's only one thing that you're not going to be able to do when you get to heaven. You know what that is? You're not going to be able to evangelize. Because everybody there is going to be what everybody in church pretends to be. Saved. Now, can I tell you the most discouraging thing for me? Can I do that? I just looked at the clock. I got plenty of extra time today. I'm, I'm ahead of schedule. This has never happened before. <laughs> the most discouraging thing for me is on a Sunday morning when, when I feel that prompting of the Lord to, you know, to do like a, a, an altar call. We don't ever ask people to come forward, but just to acknowledge I need to get saved. We even turn the lights down and, and I ask everybody to start praying. And, that, and I look around the room and I'm saying, so if you need to receive Christ as Savior today, put your hand up. It's crickets and it's ghost town. Sometimes I've told you this. I pretend. I see you in the back. Yes, you in the back row. I see you in the back row. Yes, you in the back. Because nobody can see if I'm lying or not. <laughs> I just do that because I, I can't stand the fact that nobody's responding. This, here's my challenge. Don't you love your church? I love our church. I love you guys. I don't like preaching to a room full of just believers week after week because I'm highly evangelistic in my teaching. So I just want to say, bring your friends. The people you've been witnessing to, we'll catch them and we'll clean them. <laughs> just, just bring them. I promise we will do our best to help your friends and family meet the Lord. But there's a question I'm going to ask, and again, I don't, I don't want to discourage anybody, but are you perpetuating the process? Are you perpetuating the process by participating in that process of preaching. And I don't mean where you stand on a street corner and you're all going to hell. I've never seen that work. I guess it does work. But, but just to tell people about the Savior, are you doing it? I hope that you are. Pastor Greg Laurie sums up evangelism this way because a lot of people think, you know, I just don't know how to evangelize. Greg Laurie basically says this. It's like one starving beggar telling another starving beggar where to find the bread of life. Hey, I was starving and I found the bread of life. His name is Jesus. I'd like to tell you about him. It's just that simple. So the Old Testament prophets predicted our salvation. The apostles and the faithful, including you, have preached about our salvation. And now Peter's going to close by reminding us that angels ponder our salvation. And I got to tell you, I wish that we could spend more time on this, but Peter didn't. So we're going to keep this kind of short also. But angels appear all over the Bible. As, as you start studying the scriptures, you realize that angels are a big part of God's plan for the ages. God gives them a lot of responsibility. And they play many roles, like I said, in God's plan for the ages. The author of Hebrews, though, really helps you and I understand the main role of angels in our lives. If you look up at the screen, Hebrews 1.14 the author of Hebrews just reminds us that they are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. So if you really dig into this verse, you realize that what the author of Hebrews is saying is that God uses angels. I wonder how many times God uses angels to, to save our lives before we come to know Christ and then to save our lives after we come to know Christ. The, the angels are there to keep us in a place where God's plan can be fulfilled in our lives. So if you've ever been walking down the street and you're like, man, I should have died. That truck almost hit me. I don't know how that truck didn't hit me. I get this idea of an angel just going boop and then bringing you back, push you out of the way and bring you back after the truck is gone. You're going, that truck should have run me over. And your friends go, that truck should have run you over. You're just like, it must have been an angel, right? And then after you're saved, they continue to serve you as a member of Christ's church in so many different ways. Angels are at war behind the scenes. In our study of Daniel, we learned a lot about spiritual warfare and the role of angels and demons and all of those things. But we need to remember that angels are created beings. They are not all-knowing. And, and so they learn. They grow. There's some interesting things about angels. He says here, uh, verse 12, the very end of our text, he says that when it comes to our salvation, these are things which angels desire to look into. If you look at the words that Paul used here, uh, Peter used here, it, it draws this picture of like a person who's standing on their tippy toes, looking over a wall, trying to see better. 
It's just this idea that angels are peering into this world, specifically looking at believers in the local church, and they want to know more. But it's not knowledge, it's comprehension. They want to comprehend more about us. So let, us let me give you a couple of scriptures you can go read. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Ephesians 3, and 1 Timothy 3 all tell us that angels observe the conduct of believers in the local church. And the idea is they're trying to understand us, and they're trying to understand our salvation, but it's a huge struggle for them. And this is why. Number one is that angels can't be saved. In Scripture, we see that we've got fallen angels and we've got faithful angels. But from the time of the big fall of angels with Lucifer, there's no crossing over. The faithful have remained faithful. The fallen have remained fallen. The faithful are never going to fall, as far as I understand Scripture. And the fallen angels are never going to be redeemed. So one of the things about angels is that they can't be saved. And so when they look at our salvation, it's mind-blowing to them. It's mind-blowing that God would take his perfect sinless son and send him to die for the likes of us. And you may go, well, thanks, Pastor Randy. Well, let's just think about it. Think about how many Christians take their salvation for granted and angels are looking on going, do you realize what Jesus, the king that I worshiped in heaven, did for you? And you're acting like this? That's what Peter is communicating. That's what the New Testament communicates. Just share some thoughts here, and I'm going to try to read these word for word because I want to make sure I don't miss anything. But angels eagerly observe God's program of human redemption, but they don't seem to completely comprehend it. In Luke 15, Jesus said that angels rejoice over one repentant sinner, but the writings of the apostles seem to indicate that they're also baffled that God would allow his sinless son to die a brutal death in order to redeem this fallen human race. And maybe what Peter is saying is this, is that angels are baffled when a former drug addict gets saved and becomes a pastor. Angels are baffled when a former prostitute gets saved and becomes a good wife and a good mother. But angels are equally baffled when maybe one of those that I just referred to after getting saved, returns to their sin and returns to the things that they used to do. Or maybe angels are baffled when born-again believers allow suffering and persecution or any other thing to steal their joy. Angels are going, what are you complaining about? You're saved. <laughs> My God did that for you. This is what Peter's trying to communicate to us is that they can't experience salvation and they eagerly yearn to comprehend God's work in our lives, but they're also freaked out when you and I, the recipients of salvation, take that salvation lightly. When we stop living in awe of our salvation. So let's draw this to a conclusion because I believe that Peter has masterfully communicated one thing to us today, and that is that living in awe of our salvation is the key to persevering through suffering and persecution. This whole book is about suffering and persecution. So what does he spend the first 12 verses talking about? Salvation. He says, make sure you've got salvation. Make sure you understand your salvation. And make sure that you are in awe of your salvation because you're going to suffer. And Peter says, if you're in awe of your salvation, suffering is going to be nothing for you. You're going to persevere through it just fine. Well, the example I want to use as we close is the church at Ephesus. Peter encourages us, but Jesus knew there's going to be some of us, and maybe in this room or watching online today, that have received salvation, and because of suffering or persecution or pride or other things, we're no longer in awe of our, of our salvation. And, and Jesus says, I've, I've got a solution for that. So he's speaking to the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, and he's commended them for their works. He's commended them for their labor. He's commended them for their perseverance. And most of all, he commends them that they had not allowed false teachers or false doctrines into the church. In other words, Jesus says, you guys are like 
a hardworking, doctrinally sound, exemplary church. But I've got this one thing against you. Look at the screen. He says, nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left, not lost, you have left your first love. He says, you're doing everything right. You could write a manual on doctrine and theology and practical Christian living. He says, you guys are an exemplary church. He says, but you know what? You're so right that you're wrong because you've made it about being right. You've made it about the right doctrine, the right theology, the right practice, the right this, the right that. He says, but the one thing that you've done is you've taken your eyes off of the awe of your salvation. You've left your first love. So he says this. Here's the solution. Three things. He says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. He's not saying remember the sin you were saved from. He says, remember the awe that you once had when you were just so in awe of me, Jesus would say, and of your salvation, and then look where you are now. He says, it was a slippery slope and you're sliding. He says, do you want that? awe again? Do you want that wonder of your young, new salvation? And I think most of us would go, yeah, I do, Lord. I want that, that giddiness, like the faith of a child. I want that back. He says, okay, you remember what it was like. He says, repent. And we don't like that word repent. And we always think, you know, he's talking about some deep, dark, terrible sin, and maybe he is. But I think in this case, he's just saying, repent of letting something else become your master passion rather than me. Jesus says, I was once your master passion. Now doctrine, theology, and all that other stuff is your master passion. You, you need to return to me. And then the third thing he says is, do the first works. What he's saying is, remember when you were a young believer and you used to set the alarm half an hour early so you could get up and read and worship and pray. Remember when you were at the church every time the doors were open. Why? Because that place just represented Jesus and you wanted to be where Jesus was. Remember how you used to listen to old teachings from Pastor Chuck or Chuck Missler or, you know, anybody that, that taught the word and now you drive down the road and it's Led Zeppelin again. You know? He, he says, don't let anything replace your first love. And Lord, this morning, I don't think I have to say another word. You've said everything we need to hear. And Father, if we're in a place today where we have lost the awe of our salvation, then I pray today, Lord, we would listen to those words of Jesus and we would remember how awesome it was when you were our first love. And then we would repent of the, thing, the things, Lord, that, that allowed something else to become our first love. And then we would just go back to those daily disciplines. We would redo the things that kept our relationship with you fresh and exciting. And Lord, I believe you're speaking, and I believe that you're calling people to make decisions today. You're, you're calling one group of people to say, hey, today's the day I'm finally going to give my heart to Jesus. Today's the day I, I am going to get saved. Other people are saying, today is the day that I am going to rededicate my life to Jesus. I've gotten lax. I've gotten loose. I've, I've reattached to things that I had once turned away from, and those things are dragging me down, and Jesus is no longer my first love. I'm going to get up tomorrow morning. I'm going to read. I'm going to pray. I'm going to worship. I'm, I'm going to return to doing those things. And Lord, I believe we need these as, as a church and as individuals because here in the year 2022, Lord, we're looking at the world around us. It's much like the world that Peter wrote to. That soft persecution was about to turn to extreme persecution. And Peter's audience was not going to survive it if they did not regain the awe of their salvation. Lord, I wonder how many Christians have not even survived what began in 2020. They're, they're away from you. They're away from the church. But today you're calling them back. So, Lord, whether it's that people need to just reach out to you today and say, God, I've, I've ran from you long enough. Here's my sin, Jesus. I take from you the free gift of righteousness. I turn from my sin. I want to be saved. Or whether it's believers saying, Lord, I'm coming home. You're calling us to make decisions today. 
and you've given us so many good reasons to do so, God. And so as we finish this first section of First Peter, Lord, these first 12 verses where you have spoken so clearly to us about our salvation, don't let us walk out of here today, Lord, without being in complete awe of that salvation. Let today be a turning point, a new beginning. We ask all this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Jesus Christ, my Lord.